Um, so I'll give a quick introduction um, to Patterson and we'll get started from there um, to discuss the views behind me. Um, so Ebony G. Patterson received her BFA from Edna Manley College in Kingston, Jamaica and her MFA from Santa Fox College of Design and Visual Art um, at Washington University in St. Louis in Missouri. Um, Patterson has had solo exhibitions and projects at many U.S. institutions, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, the SCAD Museum of Art, um, the SCAD College of Art and Design, the Museum of Art and Design in New York, um, and has upcoming solo exhibitions at the Baltimore Museum of Art and the Press Art Museum in Miami, so a very exciting year ahead. Um, her work was included in the 32nd Sao Paulo bi Biennial and the 12th Havana Biennial as well as in Prospect 3 here in New Orleans, and so some of you might have been familiar with her work um, if you've been coming to Prospect for a long time. Um, so with, without further ado, I'll um, give the mic over to Ebony and Katie. So thank you so much. Uh, before we get started, I want to say a huge thank you to the Hellas Foundation, both for enabling this incredible spread you see behind you. Um, and for sponsoring this wonderful lecture with Ebony, who we're so thrilled to have here at NOMA to talk about um, both Robert Rauschenberg's work and also the idea of collage and assemblage as a strategy for contemporary art making um, and the way that works by artists like Rauschenberg inform the work of artists working today. Um, NOMA was able, through the support of the Hellas Foundation, to purchase this incredible 1979 work by Robert Rauschenberg uh, in 2013. And just in the last several months, has been able to install this in our new kind of in our newly reconfigured energy gallery. So it's a chance to basically move our permanent collection galleries all the way up through the present day and tell new kinds of stories about the history of 20th century art that take us all the way through the present. Um, this acquisition by Rauschenberg, I think, really speaks to a lot of the issues that artists from the 60s and 70s onward have been thinking through in their practices in all kinds of ways. Uh, this work is titled Spread, and it was very exciting for NOMA for a number of reasons. As some of you may know, uh, Rauschenberg uh, is one of the 20th century's most important artists, and an artist who has really strong connections to Louisiana. He was born in Port Arthur, Texas, uh, but much of his family throughout his young life lived uh, in Lafayette, Louisiana, and in fact, many still do today. And so he had a very strong connection to the American South that carried through in his practice in all kinds of ways. And I think these spreads that he began making in the 1970s are perhaps the best example of the way that the kind of visual vocabulary of the South and of Louisiana especially informed his work. Um, so he made over 95 of these large scale works that he called spreads um, between 1976 and uh, the early 80s. And these works, as you see, are these sort of composite pieces that use all sorts of different collage and printmaking techniques to create this pastiche of different images, swatches of fabrics, found objects like combs, and some even go as far to include elements of furniture, working door frames that in some iterations people were able to walk through in past installations, that really speak to a kind of very robust and quite diverse perspective on American life. The idea of the spread comes both from the idea of an expanse of land, a spread of land, um, and also from the idea of the bedspread, right? A sort of fabric covering that one often uses in their homes. And in this case, particularly thinking about the history of Southern quilt making technique, this idea of taking together all different swatches of fabric that come from all different places and applying that to the language of collage as a way to speak to a much broader perspective on American life, and that was the map, and then that which was readily available through more conventional means like landscape and portraiture. Um, so, you know, if we traditionally think of a spread of land, a large landscape painting as being a single image with like one perspective or point of view that goes backwards into space, in this case you have, I don't know, a hundred different small images that take you all across the country from like weird 1970s car advertisement ads to Siamese cats and intimate home scenes and images of oil rigs and technology, all of these things that speak to a diversity of perspectives on America and American cultural life. And I think especially kind of try and offer a more intimate and personal idea about this country and all of the different people and forms that come to make it. One of, I think, all of our favorite parts about this piece is that it, it, as you kind of walk around this way, 
okay, feel, feel free to do so while I talk, you'll notice that the side panel here is composed of mirror and plexiglass with a little opening right here so that as you approach the work from the side, <laughs> as you approach the work from the side, your face, at the exact height of a you know, typical person, becomes one of the pieces of this quilt that he's created, one of the kind of elements of the quilt. And so I think, you know, for Rauschenberg, this was really about kind of trying to come up with a more complex way of modeling contemporary culture and all of the different things that come together to form it, and also to offer somewhat of a more personal perspective on um, art of the 20th century that would think not just about the idea of fine art, but also the art of the home, the art of the personal. And this is something that really figured in his art in all kinds of ways throughout his practice. And in all kinds of ways, this model, I think, has been very influential for contemporary artists working today who are, you know, in large measure using very similar techniques to explore some of the complexities of contemporary culture. And we were so excited to have Ebony Patterson with us today to talk about some of these ideas because I think in addition to, in many ways, working with some of these same forms, working with fabric and images, um, and kind of creating these assemblages and collages that are all sorts of different forms, her work also speaks to kind of mining some very underrepresented histories, which I think is something that Rauschenberg, in his way of kind of imagining this work as a more all-encompassing perspective or point of view, was also beginning to think about. So I thought I'd give Ebony a few minutes to share a bit about her work, and then we can have a little discussion. Hi guys. <laughs> so there's an iPad that's going around with a couple of images of my work. Um, so that, that was the best way to, to engage this very intimate experience. So the G, let's just get the question out of the way. Like, what does the G stand for? I like to look to joke that it's answer gangsta, but it really stands for grace. Whereas my mother would say God's richest blessing. Um, so my work has a lot, you know, like looks a lot at ideas around visibility and invis uh, visibility and invisibility, and I'm really interested in how working class people um, and people of color um, use uh, popular cultural space and dress as a way to perform dignity in spaces that they would not be allowed to do that. So how does something like social media? which elevates or activates and creates a sense of access for ordinary people to be seen in spaces that they would not otherwise be seen. Um, there's an article several years ago, well not an article, it was a blog post, um, that a young woman had written this narrative about an experience that she had with her mother as a child. Um, and her, um, her neighbor at the time, an elderly woman, was having a very hard time uh, getting uh, her social security uh, from the social security office. And she describes this moment where her mother essentially puts on her Sunday vest and puts on her pearls. And she says to her mother, as a young girl, why are you dressing up like this? We're only going to the social security office. And the mother responds by, uh, to that saying, I dress this way so they take us seriously. So she recognizes, one, her social location, and two, what dress does. She sees dressing as a political action that then forces the authority who she's about to engage to take her seriously. It says, I am purposeful, I am present, and I am here. And I'm interested in bodies that are not allowed that kind of space to occupy everyday space in that way, and uses clothing, garments, um, other objects that may be associated with bling or bling culture as a way of carving themselves into presence. So materially, I use everything and the kitchen sink. So, not the kitchen sink yet. But. <laughs> <laughs> so I use lots of glitter, um, I use lots of uh, from, uh, fabrics that I may acquire um, from different places that I'll visit. Um, you, you may also hear me sounding funny, I'm from Jamaica, so of course I get some fabrics from home. Um, but then in addition to that too, um, quite often I also work with uh, a number of people. So like Rauschenberg, my practice is also collaborative. 
in the sense that uh, a lot of my work is photo based, but it's also very much grounded in the language of painting, like Rauschenberg. Um, but a lot of the projects are photo based. The garments are all, uh, they're all customized and made by a tailor, and then a model wears that, and then someone photographs the work for me, and then that work that's photographed then gets edited, and then that image is sent off to a commercial, <laughs> and then that image is sent off to a commercial weaver. And then when the weaving comes back, um, then I sit on top of that, and I embellish and work the surface. And for me, um, all of these materials sit or um, relate to a language, uh, to the language of painting. So a swatch of fabric is merely just palette. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not incredibly concerned about where it comes from, but what can it do, or how does it begin to create passages within the work, or how does it begin to activate the surface, and by extension, activate the figures or the subjects that I'm also referencing. And then there are times too when those flat moments are also activated by uh, objects. So I might lean something on something, like I might lean a bunch of shoes around uh, a flat or on top of a flat work. Um, there's a, on the, the iPad that's going around, um, there's a long uh, jacquard tapestry that has 18 pairs of glass shoes that sit on top of that. It was kind of made in memorial for uh, 18 children that were murdered between January and April um, during my time I was um, home in 2016. Or um, in more recent works that also continue to, to engage in this idea around memorialization, there may be shoes or garments that are also hung inside or onto um, two-dimensional things. That's it for now. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, you share a little bit about Kind of, you know, more specifically, how you feel like works like this and legacies like Rauschenberg's and artists working with these kinds of techniques using fabrics and things that weren't really part of the traditional kind of fine art lexicon very early on in the 60s and 70s have been important to you both as sort of something to be inspired by and also something to sort of extend in various ways. So, I mean, one of the things that interested me, even though I'm being here, was that was last summer I was in. I was given the privilege of uh, doing a residency with, I think it was seven other colleagues um, at the Rauschenberg Foundation, which is such a gift. Um, that's one of the things that's really beautiful about, um, about Bob, as he was affectionately called during our time there, was his, his, the, the levels of his generosity, not just through his collaboration, but his continued need to kind of continually give back. And I'll share one story before I answer that question. So, at the Rauschenberg Foundation, there's a toilet. And so, Bob <laughs> Rauschenberg, in his last year, he was wheelchair bound because I think he had a stroke. Um, and so there's a toilet that's kind of like lifted off the ground, maybe about four, four to five inches. And that toilet was like in the main studio um, where about three or four of us worked. And every time I use that bathroom, I just think, what a spiritual experience this is. <laughs> My ass, Bob's ass. <laughs> but you know, like, it's difficult not to think about uh, the legacies of Rauschenberg's practice, um, and, um, or not to be able to reference those, uh, the, the legacy of his practice. When thinking about, say, for example, like Radcliffe Bailey, um, who is, I know he's, he's based in Atlanta, but when I think about like Radcliffe's work, or I think like of uh, somebody like Kevin Beasley, or my colleague right here, actually, Nicola White, um, who's in residence at John Mitchell, it's, it's, it's difficult not to think about the contributions or uh, <coughs> the point, you know, Rauschenberg as a point of reference. What was really, what's always been interesting for me with his practice is, you know, like, is the, is the willingness to play. You know, he talks about experimentation a lot and how experimentation um, was so integral. I mean, after he won the Venice, uh, that Venice Biennial Prize, he 
he phoned back to his studio and told the person, his studio manager, to destroy all of his screens. Because what? He made this thing, he got our knowledge for this thing, I don't want to keep making the same shit, right? And if he's making the same thing, then it means that I'm no longer learning. It's in the discovery, the play, where the learning happens. And he talks about that excitement. I mean, that's the thing that's exciting for me. Um, when I sit on top or in my work as I'm embellishing, I'm learning about, uh, not just about the materials, um, but I'm learning also too about the chance that happens in working with those materials. Um, and every, every experience feels new. It's never, the, it's never the same. And I think that the spirit of openness um, and the fact that all material can become integrated um, into art or can become, uh, or can, uh, that could become a device in communicating something much larger um, in the work is something that's always been interesting. One of my favorite Rauschenberg statements is that it doesn't, it doesn't take courage to experiment, it takes courage to leave evidence. <laughs> really liked. Um, but I think you know. I think you're right in that you know one of the sort of main legacies of artists like Rauschenberg, right, is that they're they're pulling from these everyday images and materials, things that at the time that he was working would not be considered fine art, right? <laughs> Plastic clones, combs, like gold colored plexiglass, and you know, and other works, all sorts of things of that kind that speak both to sort of like a very intimate personal experience, right. the self, the calm. And also kind of like gender and sexuality, right? The idea of the bed, which uses all the ones work, including this one, and the idea of the bed spread. And sort of bringing those things into the realm of fine art as things that can and should be acknowledged with the same level of importance. Um, and that seems to me to be, you know, when I think about this work and just Rauschenberg's legacy in general for artists working today, I think it's that, that courage to speak to the personal and to sort of be willing to use elements that at the time when he was making these spreads and many of his earlier works, right, they were derided for being kitsch, right? Like using bed spreads and quilting <laughs> and plastic combs and all of these things and sort of like really showing the ways that these everyday objects need to be thought of as having the same level of import as much finer objects. Um, and sort of, you know, bridging the gap between the two. One of the other things Rauschenberg often talked about was like wanting to act in the space between art and life. And I think that's also something that's quite powerful for artists working today, who are sort of working to think through ways that their work might exist in institutions and in more traditional art contexts, but bringing in much broader kinds of perspectives and points of views. Well, that's one of the things that I think is actually interesting about uh, this particular work. Home comes up a lot. But the, the fact that there is this mirror that's also in the work, you know, like when we think about spaces like the museum that are often seen as like cold and removed and like relegated for a particular set of people, there's an opportunity I think that Rauschenberg does by using this kind of reflective surface. We become a part of the work, right? But at the same time, there's a possibility for ownership. It becomes ours. And in each way, each of us can claim because our bodies activate this thing in different ways and those experiences will continually be different for each person. What was interesting also too, the earlier group that we, we had an earlier group of young, um, of high schoolers, right? And so when we talked about the mirror too, generationally that became different. One person said, I feel like the presence of the mirror is actually something negative. <laughs> when you think about the continued consumption of self-imaging or the relationship to the selfie, um, but then also to thinking about the context or the time when this image, um, this work would have been made in the 70s, this is not a notion that the world was kind of preoccupied with. So what does the work made in the 1970s, right, um, do with its intention around that time then? How does that work then translate or re-translate itself or is re-energized within, within the current context? But that's the power of Rauschenberg's work. In many ways, he's a history painter. The work is continually moving. It's not just having a conversation with the history um, that it was in the time that it was made in, um, but it's also having a, a, a conversation with the moment right now. 
about one of the other really interesting things that came up in our conversation with the NOCO students. There had been one that had come to the museum several weeks before this talk, and she was like, you know, when I saw this from afar and walked up to it, I assumed it was made by a woman, right? And I think, you know, one of the things that we ended up having a long conversation about is the issue of appropriation, right? Because of course, right, like an artist like Rauschenberg in the late 70s knows how many female artists, both from here and from New York and elsewhere, who are working with fabric, working with these materials in all kinds of ways. And I think it's very much through him, and this is what we talked about, right, that a lot of those voices have made it into the mainstream, but certainly he is not the first person to work with this kind of aesthetic or this idea, whether we're speaking about the sort of longer history of quilt making in the South, which he draws upon quite extensively, or we're talking about more recent histories of like 1960s and 70s New York, where artists like Tina Gerard and Eva Hesse, the list goes on from there, are working with these kinds of materials with fabric and whatever else. And so I'd be curious, because I think we didn't quite get to that level of speaking about it before, like what your response is to that idea of the way that Rauschenberg in many ways is taking up certain kinds of legacies um, that in some ways are not his own. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in many, I mean, I think that as an artist, we all, we want to work with the art, when we make work that's not about us, right? Um, or it doesn't first start, because in one way or another, it's always us. Uh, but when it doesn't start with us, uh, I think it, it's it's not unusual. It's not an unusual charge um, for artists to take on or to do. Um, I do think that it is unfortunate because uh, one of the people that I think of even always uh, is someone like Miriam Shapiro. And when we think about the significance of an artist like Miriam Shapiro through the through the work uh, that she she coined the term femages, right, which um, you know, like also acknowledge, you know, also in acknowledging the source or the place where the material came from, the language or the history that she was also referencing, um, which was quilting and the tradition of women's work, and by using the word fem, female, feminine, and attaching that to the ages, which again uh, references collage or all of the kind of assembled. Um, uh, uh, techniques, experiences in making. Um, I think it's kind of one, um, it, it also says a lot about the fact that um, an artist like that still today I think hasn't gotten uh, nearly or as much um, credibility as Rauschenberg. Um, but it also, you know, so it, again it, it says a lot about the time, it says a lot too about our community and the way particular bodies are allowed access and agency because of they are, you know, um, and why so many are still not, um, still not mined or um, or archived in a single way. We'll open out for questions. If people have questions for Ebony or about this piece in particular. Um, had a lot 
continue, you know, like all artists, I continue to think about the work and think about the ideas as they evolve and I'm responding to that. So um, going back to what I had mentioned earlier about this interesting ideas around visibility and invisib uh, visibility and, and invisibility, I'm talking about people who exist within the, that kind of language, particularly those who are seen as invisible or as Krista Thompson would say, unvisible, because the truth is the poor, you know, like people would say, the poor are not invisible, they're quite visible, so what does it mean? What does that term invisible really mean? There's also the counter, which is unvisible. Um, and then also too, in terms of a, a kind of material decision, right? And thinking about those ideas. Once you remove the skin, then you're having to deal with a pattern surface, a body that also has pattern, right? There is this, these small or very subtle moments of contrast that may happen where the body may become apparent or not apparent. It may disappear as much as it may uh, may appear. So I think it's, you know, like, these decisions just happen because I just is not willing to keep painting the same thing for the next 20 years, you know? And as uh, time and space and information that I'm considering continues to shift, so will the work. And I, I really hope that 10 years from now I'm not still making the same stuff, because then it means that I'm not making work anymore. It means that, that I'm making product. Um, and I have to keep moving. It's, it's evidence that I'm thinking or thinking through things, you know? Hi, I'm from Kingston. Hi. <laughs> I have a question directly related to some possible Jamaican influences on your work that I've always wondered about. Um, one of the things that I've noticed also connecting to your question about the white faces and the clothing and things like that is um, whether or not there are some influences that you grew up with, National Dance Theatre Company, John Canoe, um, Nine Night. I know um, there's been some recent scholarship on the connections between um, Nine Night and um, dance hall traditions. Um, and I'm just wondering, even Igungun, you know, there, there have been some scholars that have connected some um, Igungun traditions, Yoruba traditions to Nine Night as well. And I'm just wondering if um, any of those were conscious in your development of um, your in installations, or they sort of came through you, maybe? I mean, I think that there are some, um, there are some influences that I'm grabbing on that are as much national as they are uh, coming from, what's that other fancy word that academics like to use? The global self. Global. Um, that's the other one. Um, so for example, someone from Haiti may go, well I also see like how voodoo has informed uh, this. I remember when I had done a car, right? So doing a car in Kingston, um, doing a car in Kingston had an entirely different relationship uh, to what it would look like or be seen um, in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, or then when I took it to LA, people started thinking about like lowrider culture or Chicano culture. Um, so that I, so I think each of them, that's the nature of work generally. Um, but going back to your question, not directly. I mean, I think you know, like I come from a generation that grew up in that hall. You know, like I, I, I watched it. Um, come mainstream, but it's not really dance hall as a culture that so much interested me as much as uh, what it did politically and all of the misunderstandings around it. In the same way that so many uh, spaces that are, or efforts that are politically centered, um, especially when particular bodies uh, that are mobilizing that, are somehow demonized. You know, it's kind of like the moment that we're having right now in this country with Black Lives Matter. Um, so even though the conversation in that, we, you know, like it, it totally makes sense, somehow it's being seen as a threat. You know, and, and what's interesting in that conversation is that people are always referencing the last, um, the last uh, Black civil rights action, which would have been action of the 60s, but people then forget that even that moment was also demonized too. You know, like people like to say like, Martin Luther King would be ashamed, but Martin Luther King was also seen as a terrorist at one point by this very country. 
So I'm interested in um, in these points, you know, like in the way that an, um, something like dance hall uh, becomes a political act of saying, I'm here, and you're not gonna fucking deny me. And I, I dare to perspective of your discomfort, right? Um, and if you're uncomfortable with it, then you have to deal with that. I don't have to deal with that, right? And I think that's, um, I think that when we think about like, just larger, um, the larger conversations around um, so-called black popular, popular culture, um, and the sense of activation, even around, like, say, if you think more recently, around bling culture and hip hop, you know, like the term bling bling, the fascination with things shiny, it's all about this kind of performativity around access. You know, so there's been this kind of, uh, there's also been like discussions academically about um, the, the infatuation with material culture and how that's also a problem. But if one just steps back from all of that, one also gets it. Like, it's totally about performing this idea that I too have access. If you think that you have more money in your bank account and you can't afford that $8,000 back, watch me. Watch me and my version. I too can perform. It may not be the real thing, but all I need to do is to be able to pass in that moment. And for a moment, I become visible. For a moment, in that light, that camera light, that was not made for me and my skin, I become seen and I shine. And so those are the things that I think about. I, I have a note actually regarding you know, this issue and you're speaking about this question of access. Um, and I wondered if you could talk about some of these incredible kind of more public art projects that you've done over the course of the past mm -hmm. several years, whether it's like the posters in Kingston or the Coffin's, the Coffin procession that you did, and kind of how those relate to other art that you make and how you think about the relationship between them. Kind of along this idea of like art versus life and how those things yeah. come together or come apart or how they connect. I'll talk about more recent one. Yeah. Um, I'll talk about the project of Byronese. People always seem interested, intrigued by that as a process, you know, like, so there's one, we're working with this, like, corporation that's all about, like, selling shit. Um, <laughs> Do you guys all see that? It's yeah. in the iPad, the Windows. So one other thing that's things that's not in there is that there's an audio component. So I'll explain all of that. So that year, I mean, it was for a Christmas window, right? So Christmas is like one of the most like kitschy things you could ever do. Um, you know, like it's, it's a window at Christmas time, and it had a theme. It was love, peace, and joy. Um, and I chose to risk each of us as actors, we were asked to choose one of those words to make to respond to. I already knew what I wanted wanted to do, but I thought, okay, love seems like the most abstract to, to me, like it seemed like the most nuanced. Um, and so with the piece, there were 23 mannequins, and each of those mannequins wore customized uh, outfits that I had made working with a tailor back home. And they sit in this kind of overgrown garden. The garden, uh, for me, is both a uh, point of rest, uh, reference in terms of a social demarcation, but it also references the grave. And then in some ways too, it also references the body. So the idea of, you know, like, um, you know, like, we come from the earth, we return to the earth. The garden is also to about the gaze. Um, it's also to about embellishment. Um, so it's embellishment on the body as much as it is embellishment on um, and so in the, about the half of those mannequins then also had uh, video projections onto them. So all of them, they had patterns all over. So the clothing was patterned and the skin was pat patterned in another way. Um, and then about 15 of them had video projections. And it would go from the pattern of the skin of that mannequin to uh, the face of someone. And it would slowly, the face of the person would slowly change from pattern to a record to a face. And it would ask something. It would say, see me. And then there'd be a little voice that would say, why can't you see me? And it would just slowly, one at a time, 
you would hear each one say, see me, see me, see me, until it became a group call that crescendoed. So it went from, see me, see me, and then there would be another voice that would say, I'm right here. Why can't you see me? So all of this audio was played on the street. So as we're walking by the window, you would hear this. So a little creepy in the beginning. <laughs> um, but the you know, but the idea that in order to, you know, like I had somebody the other day after our talk say to me, oh, you know, like I don't want to sound like black people are so angry. And I said, I said, well, you know, I said, I said, right now I'm a little annoyed. You know? Um, but I said, but think about it. If I poke you and I tell you why poking me, your poking me is our problem, and you continue to just keep poking me, you know, like you're disregarding my feelings, my sentiment, my voice. And so in, in many ways, the project uh, was called, it was called PRESENCE, in all caps. Um, it's about that, it's about acknowledgement. And it's about first, it was asking to be acknowledged, and then the crescendo is a demand. And here, you're not going to be me. And so the thing that was interesting to me about Barney is just thinking about what Barney's is. I mean, it's a department store that sells you know, pricey clothing. And the fact that it would use its, uh, its public windows to engage its viewers or not, right? Because everybody's gonna go in because they can't afford to. Uh, but the fact that they would, you know, use projects like this uh, to engage its public, I thought, um, you know, really generous. Um, and so it was myself, there was Nick Cave, there was Studio Joe, there was Rob Pruitt, um, and there was also Trey and Steve Parker from South Park. Um, and all of the projects all had, um, you know, like interesting ways of like either challenging the audience or even challenging the store or the, you know, like the what store represented. Um, but yeah, I like, I, I, when I made that project, I just thought, hmm, there's that woman who's uptown with blue hair. How uncomfortable can I make her as she has to walk past this each day? So that the next time she looks at someone who comes from this society, who is seen as invisible, and with all of the stereotypes that she may load onto that body, that she may peel back that stereotype, even for a moment, to actually attempt to see that. about like this politics of visibility and visibility. I think, you know, the various ways in which this technique or strategy, collage, assemblage, whatever, like in bringing so many things together, in some ways it borders on abstraction, right? Mm -hmm. Like you bring so many things together that you can't look at one. Right. And thinking about how that maps onto what you're speaking about, this idea of the politics of visibility and how we make voices present. I'm wondering if you could speak about that idea, and especially work like yours that draws from so many different material reference to create this sort of like incredible, vibrant, blade stick, right? But at the same time, right, because it has so many different sources, mm -hmm. also speaks to like a very diverse set of experiences that maybe is harder to pinpoint exactly. I'm not, I'm not concerned about whether or not you can pinpoint where it comes from. Yeah. You know, because it's all, it's just material yeah. to me. And that's the thing that I think is like, you know, like when we think about Rauschenberg's work, even though there are all of these passages in the work because of these images or because of the color, the way the color vibrates on top of each other or the fact that things jump out or they fall back. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a language around materials um, and the engagement with materials on that surface. So in my case, be it the surface that the that you know that that relates to the body or the surface that the body actually sits in, or in this case, the surface that these images are embedded in or or disappear into, because there are also moments where the photograph gets uh, 
gets obliterated. I think that we're also talking about, too, in some ways, these ideas are on the passage in time um, uh, within materials. But I, I, I the, where it comes from doesn't matter to me as much, as much as um, what it all does when it's activated or when it all comes together. Um, because the truth is, everything's coming from China. Um, <laughs> so, one point, anyway. So let's not even assume that. Okay. Unless <laughs> there's any, any final questions? Well, thank you all so much for being here uh, for this program, and thank you again to the Halix Foundation for their support of this, and to Ebony for sharing her work and her ideas, and I think really bringing this piece to life in new ways as well. So thank you very, very much. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.